Hi everyone, I'm Uma. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and uh, I'm a scientist. Uh, I work at the NCBS, which is close by. So I'm sure all of you, um, you may have noticed earlier in the evening these little bats flying around. There were crows, other birds, lots of plants. And most of the times we forget that all around us, we are surrounded by other species or biodiversity. We live with so many other species around us. Mostly we are tuned out to them. But I'm really curious about understanding all of our biodiversity, all of these species which live together with us. So, you know, one of the most beautiful things to me is this map. And it's the map of the distribution of species or biodiversity across the world. In this case, we're talking about vertebrates. Vertebrates means fish, um, mammals, birds, uh, reptiles, amphibians. And you can see immediately what pops out, that some places in the world have more biodiversity than do others, right? It's not a uniform distribution. It's not the same everywhere. Um, and if you look, say, a little bit more closely, say we look at India, you'll see that where is the biodiversity high? It seems to be high in the northeast, like a comet into the Himalayas, and also in the Western Ghats. What's common between these two areas? They're both mountain ranges, right? They're both places where mountains occur. So is it really that there are more species that occur in mountain ranges? So first of all, why would we have more biodiversity in any place? The reason a place has high biodiversity is because more species are being created here. But how are species created? How do they evolve? Well, for a long time, people have wondered about this. I'm sure all of you have read about Darwin and his musings about evolution. Uh, and one of the concepts that Darwin and other evolutionary biologists came up with is that the process of speciation, the process of the birth of new species, um, it happens in various ways. But one of the common or the most well-accepted ones is called allopatry. What is allopatry? It's a process, and basically it's really simple. You have one population, then for some reason there's a barrier, and this splits into two areas, right? And these two populations, the animals or plants that live in them, don't see each other, they don't exchange genes for a very long time, and eventually they become different enough such that if they were to meet, they wouldn't be able to mate with each other, they wouldn't be able to breed. At this point now, you have two species instead of one. So this is the process of allopatry and speciation. And what's most important here, as you can see, is the presence of barriers, right? So now I'm going to take you back. We discussed mountains, and we discussed the process of speciation. We thought that mountains have high biodiversity. We learned that you know, speciation occurs by allopatry. So maybe there's more allopatry, or there are more barriers in mountains. Let's explore this thought a bit. So let's look at this mountain range. It's just an, an, it's like a drawing of a mountain range. And imagine species which live on the top of the mountain. All of you who've ever been on a hike or a trek, oh, sorry, <laughs> will, will remember that you know, when you go up the mountain, it's much colder up there, right? Whereas at the bottom of the mountain, it's hotter. It's probably rainy in both places. But obviously, a species which lives on the mountain top may not be able to live in the hotter environments at the bottom of the mountain. So are mountains really isolated in this way? Are there barriers which occur then between these species which live on mountain tops? And concomitantly, the species which live at the bottom, are there no barriers for them at all? So basically, in these mountain ranges, because of the shape of the mountain, are there these little pockets of populations which will then eventually become different species? So let's go back to the Western Ghats. Let's look at reality. This is an example, right? So yes, we do have these pockets of populations in mountains. And this is uh, the Western Ghats, uh, a, a beautiful picture by a student of mine uh, who went on to become a photographer for National Geographic, Prasanjit Yadav. And you can see. Uh, immediately that the tops of these mountains are smaller in area, they are isolated, and they are cooler, right? So species that live there, for example, species which live on one mountain top, 
may not see the ones on another for many years. So now we have to actually test this. How do we go about testing whether this is the case? Well, this is a nice picture, but we can actually break the Western Ghats into you know, a mountain like we saw earlier, that illustration, right? So this is actually a cross-section of the Western Ghats, and you can see that the mountain is going up and down, uh, and there are parts of the mountain where it goes really down and really high. That deep valley you can see over there, that's the Palghat Gap, where the Western Ghats breaks for about 40 kilometers and starts up again. So you can imagine that those species which live on those mountain tops, for them, the biggest barrier in this whole range is the Palghat Gap, right? So what we need to do now is to actually try and understand if this is true. So how do we study this? Well, we would imagine then that birds which live on mountain tops on either side of these gaps should be different, right? But how do we assess whether they are different? What does different mean? Well, luckily for us, the story of our past, the past of those birds, is actually written in their DNA, right? And so if we could read their DNA and compare the DNA of the birds, we could actually tell how different or similar they are to each other. So what we have to do then is go to the Western Ghats, catch these birds, sample their DNA, and try and understand how different they are. So that's what we did. Uh, we had a lot of field gear which we packed up. Uh, we went into the field, uh, and then we put up these large nets. They're called mist nets. So uh, don't worry, it doesn't hurt the birds. The birds fly into them, they don't see them, they're so thin. And they have these little pouches, so they fall into them. And then you can basically extract the birds from the pouch, hold them in your hand. Birds are really gentle, unlike rats and uh, other species I work with as well, which tend to bite. Uh, but these guys are really gentle as long as you hold them gently. You can just stretch out their wing, take a small capillary, it's like a thin tube, just poke it into their vein and you get a few drops of blood and that's it, that's all you need. Once you have that, you of course go back to the lab, extract DNA from this blood, read the DNA sequences of these birds, compare the DNA sequence and what did we find. So I'll show you one example of this particular species called the short wing. When we looked at birds on either side of this gap, the DNA suggested that they had diverged or separated from each other, that they were different for millions of years. That's amazing, right? It's just 40 kilometers, birds can fly, but somehow these birds hadn't mated with each other or hadn't seen each other for millions of years. And not only that, not only did, was their DNA different, they had also become different behaviorally. These birds <laughs> sound so different on either side of this Palghat gap that actually they don't recognize each other. So, you know, the genesis of this story is actually that uh, a young student came into my lab and he said, you know what, I work on birds and I've been studying these birds, they're the same birds, same species on either side of the Palghat gap and they just sound so different. So that's how this curiosity started. It actually started with an observation and the fact that this song sounded so different. And today, when you actually do playback experiments, when you record the song of one bird and play it on the other side, they just look the other way. They don't recognize the song at all. So this reinforces our other data or our uh, you know, analysis suggesting that they've really been isolated for a very long time. Okay, so you know, as a scientist, you have to look for generalities, right? One bird, so what? Maybe it's an outlier, something strange going on, can't fly, some problem. So we have to see whether this is true for other species. So what we did was we actually sampled not just this one short wing, but we sampled 24 birds that live on these mountain tops. Really pretty birds, you can see, really beautiful ones like the white eye and so on. And what we found was that for 10 of these 24, the most different birds were always on either side of the Palghat Gap. So this is nice because it becomes more general and it tells me that for any species, this is true for birds which can fly, for frogs, for you know, um, rats and mice, the most two dif distinct individuals will always be on either side of the Palghat Gap, suggesting then that the Palghat Gap is a barrier driving speciation, right? And our study actually 
ended up adding to the biodiversity in the Western Ghats because these birds, which we thought were one species, turned out to be three, and another one turned out to be four. And so we multiplied the biodiversity simply by understanding the species and their histories living here. So that's all really nice, but uh, you know, we are all um, today uh, in the Anthropocene, as we call it, the age of humans. And the age of humans is dominated, uh, while we're excitedly studying biodiversity, also by the loss of biodiversity. So I'll show you some uh, really uh, you know, interesting um, images. So this is, uh, this is uh, like a small patch of uh, the Western Ghats in the Palani Hills. I don't have to focus too much on anything except that uh, look at the ratio of the green, the dark green, the light green, to the red and the maroon. And you'll see that over time, basically between 1973 and 2014, the red has basically really mushroomed out, right? And the green has really shrunk. So imagine those birds that live in that green. They are now relegated to these tiny, tiny patches of green. So is that good? There's going to be more speciation? There are more barriers? Well, maybe not, because when we have really small populations, like you see here, what's happening, fragmentation, is that you will eventually have extinction. You need large enough populations for them to survive into the future. So, you know, work like ours then helps us to kind of look at the past and think about the future. And I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is a picture of me working in a cave, like uh, some several years ago. But we were actually here excavating, looking for fossils, and trying to then get DNA from those fossils and look at what animals were like uh, long ago in time. So you might think this, lady, this woman is crazy about birds and DNA, she's a little off. And that may be, I work on tigers also, even more crazy. And why should we care, right? Why should we care about this? Well, the reality is that, you know, uh, all the fruit we eat is pollinated by wild insects. All the water we drink in Bangalore or South India comes from the Western Ghats. And as we lose these birds, this biodiversity, it's not just about climate change. It's not just about environmental change. These mountains, the habitats, the species are an integral part of the ecosystem and biodiversity. And as we lose them, we ourselves will lose uh, our quality of life and our ability to be happy on this earth. So I think it's really critical for us to understand biodiversity, to deconstruct it. That's what I did. I deconstructed this story for you of the birds in the Western Ghats, but also remember that this is a gift to us and we must conserve biodiversity going forward. Thank you.